This video is the first part of a series where I'll attempt to build a solid state Tesla coil, or SSTC for short. In an SSTC, the high voltage spark gap primary is replaced by a transistor driven primary that usually only has an input voltage in the tens or hundreds of volts. They're more efficient, quieter, and allow better control, but they're much more complicated to build than a traditional Tesla coil. The hardware is identical to a regular Tesla coil, but the challenge is to build the drive circuitry. For starters, I need to figure out exactly what the resonant frequency is going to be for this coil. To do this, I'm going to connect the top of the coil to my scope probe and the base to ground, which is also connected to a large aluminum plate beneath the coil serving as a ground plane. I'll need an external field to excite the coil and cause it to resonate, so I started with this little oscillator coil. It uses a flip-flop oscillator to drive a coil at about 4.2 kHz, which also has a capacitor in parallel with it to make it resonate at that same frequency for better efficiency. Here's what the output looks like on the oscilloscope. If I move the oscillator back and forth near the coil, you can clearly see the effect on the scope. What you're seeing is the resonant frequency of the coil superimposed on the waveform caused by the test oscillator's 4 kHz tone. Okay, so basically what's happening here is I have a driving waveform from the test oscillator that's relatively low. It's energizing the Tesla coil, which has its own resonant frequency, which will cause the whole circuit to ring at that frequency whenever the driving pulse energizes it, leaving you with this sort of waveform. The point is, if I look at the frequency of that ringing, I'll know exactly what the resonant frequency of the Tesla coil is. If I zoom in with my oscilloscope and dial my cursors in, I can see that the ringing happens at about 61 kilohertz. That was way off my calculation, which put it at about 170 kilohertz, so I suspected there might be other factors interfering with the test. I built another test oscillator with a variable frequency to see if I got the same result by doing a frequency sweep and finding out where the maximum amplitude appears on my scope. This oscillator uses a 555 timer with a trim pot to vary the frequency from 40 kilohertz to 220 kilohertz and drive a single loop of wire with just a small current. I wrapped the wire loop around the Tesla coil and dialed in the frequency. As you can see on the scope, as I get close to the resonant frequency, the voltage amplitude goes up by quite a bit. What you see on the scope is a real-time version of the frequency response curve of the coil's LC circuit. There's an amplitude peak at the resonant frequency, which then drops off quickly as you go above or below resonance. Drifting off by even a few kilohertz can reduce the output amplitude by more than 90%. Once I found maximum output amplitude, I kept my oscillator set at that frequency and checked my scope, which showed 65 kilohertz. That's still way off from what I calculated. To understand why this is happening, let's look at the equivalent circuit of a Tesla coil. You have an inductance L and a capacitance C, which together resonate at this frequency. The inductance comes from the coil, and the capacitance comes from a combination of the coil's self-capacitance and the top load, which is usually with reference to ground. This capacitance is usually extremely small, like 5 to 10 picofarads. When I hook up my oscilloscope to the coil, the connection looks like this. The problem is, when I connect the scope, the frequency completely changes by the addition of the probe capacitance. There's also stray inductance in the test lead and stray capacitance. These elements are usually minimized by the use of coax cable, but they are still present. Together, all of these factors dramatically change the resonant frequency, therefore this isn't a reliable test approach. In the next video, I'll show how to do this correctly. Okay, moving on. I printed the primary coil brackets out of brown and tan PLA pieces that ended up blending very nicely with the copper tubing used as the coil. The primary coil is just three turns of quarter inch copper tubing with a seven inch diameter. I started by running the primary off a ZBS driver and then sliding a tap to find the resonant frequency. My approach was to measure how far the top load arced, and then keep adjusting the tap until I got the longest possible arc, which should theoretically happen at resonance. This sort of worked, but the approach was fundamentally flawed, because the ZVS circuit drives the FETs based on feedback from the primary, so even if you did hit resonance on the secondary, it would cause a load on the primary to change and throw it off frequency, so it's not a stable system. It also pulls quite a bit of current regardless of what the secondary is doing, so I was maxing out my power supply even when the output was pretty weak. Okay, time for a new approach. 
I built this driver circuit that allows me to dial in a frequency similar to my test oscillator from earlier, but this time it'll drive the primary coil. Once again I'm using a 555 timer, but now I've got two frequency knobs, one for coarse adjustment and one for fine adjustment, and this is going to come in handy later. The output of the timer is then fed into a transistor pair that acts as a push-pull driver for the MOSFET gate, and the MOSFET drives the primary coil. The high frequency oscillations of the primary are isolated from the DC input through the enormous ferrite choke you saw earlier and a large capacitor bank. Okay, let's try it out. I'm testing it on a 2 ohm load resistor before I connect it to the primary coil. As you can see, I can sweep the frequency from about 100 to 300 kilohertz with the knobs. Next, I crimp the big 8 gauge wires from the driver to the primary coil. I didn't use solder, I just shoved the exposed wire into the tubing and squeezed it really hard with my pliers. Here's how the setup looks. I've got my scope leads connected across the primary to watch the frequency, and I replace the spherical top load with a sharp rod to serve as a breakout point. When I see the biggest plume of ionized air, I know I've hit resonance, but it's really easy to overshoot the frequency, even when I'm dialing in with the fine tuning knob, so I'm really glad I added it. This worked much better than the ZVS driver approach, but now I had another problem. Within a few seconds, the MOSFET driving the primary would overheat and be destroyed. I probably killed 4 or 5 MOSFETs over the course of this whole project. To remedy this, I found the biggest heatsink I had laying around and mounted my MOSFET to it. I even gave the heatsink fan its own buck converter so that when I supplied 30 volts to the driver, the fan would still maintain 12 volts. In this clip, the electric field actually forced my camera to switch to wide angle mid-recording. The field is definitely strong enough to light up a CFL from a few feet away, but I'm still not getting the cool bolts of lightning that I'm looking for. I'm pretty happy with this for a first attempt at an SSTC, but there's still some issues that need to be worked out. First. I need to figure out how to avoid the huge MOSFET heating that's happening, and second, I need to figure out how to keep the primary driver locked on the secondary resonant frequency, because even with fine-tuning the 555 timer, it still drifts off. Both of these issues will require feedback signaling from the secondary coil, and I'll cover that in my next video.